And what troubles investigators most, particularly in New York, in the counterterrorism... All right, folks, so that's uh, parts one through three of Carl Cameron's series for Fox News shortly after the September 11th attacks. Pretty boring stuff, right? No wonder you haven't heard a word about it since, unless, of course, you are a regular reader of antiwar.com or perhaps Counterpunch. But uh, I'd like to go ahead and welcome back to the show our regular guest, Philip Giraldi. He's a former CIA officer. Is a senior contributing editor, something like that, for the American Conservative Magazine and a regular contributor to Antiwar.com. His uh, column there is called Smoke and Mirrors. His new one in the American Conservative is called The Spy Who Loves Us, Israeli Espionage in America. Welcome back to the show, Phil. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm fine. Okay, so uh, we just heard uh, parts one through three of Fox News' special on Israeli spying in America right after September 11th. And uh, I guess, you know, it's sort of out of order from the article, but uh, let's sort of start there with what we know about what Israeli spies were up to inside the United States of America, and particularly in relation to any knowledge they may have had uh, about the hijackers and uh, an imminent attack on the United States. Well, those are a lot of questions. Um, I, let's let's start it with, the, you know, what you were, were talking about with Converse and and Amdocs, uh, the, okay. the two Israeli companies that have been most directly implicated in uh, involvement in uh, U.S. security and telecommunications systems. Um, as a former intelligence officer, I would make the point that if you really want to find out what's going on anywhere, the easiest way to do it or the best way to do it is to tap into somebody's communication systems and uh, telecommunication security systems. And that's precisely uh, one of the suspicions that that Fox report uh, laid out. Did you tell them the history of the Fox report? Uh, well, just uh, just a little bit that it aired right after September 11th, and then it's been taken down from the Fox News website. You have to go to the Information Clearinghouse to find it now. Right, exactly. I mean, it, it, uh, it, it was removed uh, in a couple days after it came out from the Fox News Internet site, and then uh, I believe a couple days later it disappeared completely. Uh, was completely expunged from their system, you know, telling you a little bit about what the uh, sensitivity of all this uh, was in terms of some people who didn't want the story to come out. Your your other question about 9/11 is more complicated. I I'm I'm not necessarily and and my article did not necessarily maintain that Israel knew about 9/11, although there are some people that believe that to be the be the case. All I was suggesting was that the activities of uh, the art students who were um, in the United States in large numbers and some of these moving companies uh, located in, in New Jersey specifically uh, and also some, some businesses down in Florida, where these people were living in close proximity to many of the 9-11 hijackers, it raises the suspicion that something was going on, that the uh, certainly the, the FBI, CIA, and everybody, the DEA, everybody who's looked into it, believes that uh, many of these people, uh, not necessarily all of them, many of them, were engaged in espionage activities directed against um, Arabs living in the United States. And perhaps the hijackers themselves. Perhaps the hijackers themselves, yeah. And the point is it's not suspicious to you. It's suspicious to the FBI agents, the CIA agents who did the investigating on this case. Yeah, that's the, that's the point. When we, when we uh, set out to, to write this article... We didn't want to do a hatchet job on, on the Israelis or anything like that because we didn't want it to be perceived as, as something that was, uh, was, was biased from the start. And, and basically I went out to collect all of what I thought to be reliable information coming from FBI investigations, DEA investigations, the uh, General Accountability Office uh, report, and, and information like that, which I felt would be viewed as credible, credible witness for what uh, the the state of play was in terms of Israeli espionage in the United States. Right. You're trying to make the larger point that there's something going on here, and it's not consistent with them being our number one welfare recipient and so-called ally in the world. Yeah that, yeah, that was my point at the end of the article, that you know this is not a consistent behavior. The Israelis claim they do not spy, but the evidence seems to be very heavily that they do spy. And I'm merely say, suggesting that... Uh, Anybody who receives, you know, multi-billion dollars a year from the U.S. taxpayer and also political cover at places like the United Nations and just about everywhere else maybe at least owes us a, a quid pro quo here of not spying on us. 
<laughs> right. Okay, well, uh, do me a favor, Phil. I was 10 years old at the time. I barely uh, know a thing about it. Tell uh -huh. me and, and the audience, refresh our memory about Jonathan Pollard and the case, the giant spying case in the 1980s. Yeah, well, Jonathan Pollard was uh, was an Israeli spy. He spied for at least three years for them, was receiving uh, money. Uh, his motivation apparently was somewhat uh, loyalty to Israel in a kind of generic way, but but it was mostly money that he was interested in. And uh, he worked for the um, uh, Defense Department, and he was able to steal apparently a, uh, an entire room full of uh, highly sensitive uh, documents, many of which um, uh, related to um, security of, of communication. Again, it's funny, we get back to communication systems and things like this and capabilities of satellites and, and the kind of information that, is of uh, top-level interest to any intelligence service. So he stole a whole room full of this type of classified information, gave it to Israel, and uh, Seymour Hersh, among others, believes that a lot of this information wound up in Russia, where the Israelis exchanged it for Russian permission to, to let some, uh, some uh, Russian Jews uh, leave the country. So uh, this information wound up, presumably, in the hands of the United States principal enemy. So this was not a benign activity that wound up uh, in, in just in Israel to benefit the Israelis. It well, went far beyond that. Well, now there's something that I do remember from 1986, that the Soviet Union were the bad guys and had a bunch of nuclear missiles pointed at us. Yeah, well, that's, that's the point. The defenders of Pollard often say, well, he, he really did nothing wrong. He was helping an ally. He was giving them information they needed for their defense and so on and so forth. Well, that's nonsense. And, and uh, the reason why Pollard has, has not been released uh, from prison is the fact that everybody on the inside knows very well that Pollard uh, gave them tons of information that had nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with the Middle East. And, uh, and uh, in fact, the information went on to the Russians and benefited the Russians in, in their confrontation with us. All right, now, just uh, recently, what, a month and a half ago or so, it came out that there was another Israeli spy, actually an American citizen who was spying for Israel, named ben Ami Kaddish. And uh, just from what I read in Newsweek, uh, Phil, I think uh, this sort of shed all brand new light on the Jonathan Pollard case back from 1986. How's that? Yeah, it does indeed uh, shed uh, new light on it because it suggests that at the time, the Israelis, uh, when, when Pollard was caught and Pollard was convicted, the Israeli, Israelis privately agreed with the U.S. government that they had been spying and that they wouldn't do it anymore. And uh, they, they basically said this was a rogue operation. Well, it turns out it wasn't a rogue operation because there was another rogue out there. And, uh, and also uh, the National Security uh, Agency has intercepted uh, communications that indicate that the Israelis had yet another more senior spy whom they referred to as Mega. And there's been a lot of speculation as to who Mega is. Mega obviously is still out there. Uh, I want to hear some speculation as to who Mega is. I don't think I'd better do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know a few names that are being thrown around. I mean, even Henry Kissinger has been named as a possible Mega. But uh, there are a couple more that are quite plausible when one thinks about it. But I'd rather not name names. Ah, oh, geez. All right, well, I'm trying to remember because I know that James Bamford has talked about uh, or brought up a, an old Washington Post story from 1997 or something like that where uh, they talk about that whoever this guy Mega was, he was in a position where he knew not just the file numbers but the top, even super-duper top-secret titles of article of uh, intelligence reports and so forth, that he must be a very senior-level person to have this kind of... Uh, intelligence clearance is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the theory because apparently both uh, Pollard and Kaddish were directed to steal specific uh, intelligence to request and then steal specific intelligence reports or assessments. And they had the names, they had the numbers, and these names and numbers because the sensitivity of the reports could only have come from someone who was at the very top level of the U.S. government. At the very top level, so this would be. Maybe not necessarily cabinet level, but uh, say uh, someone like the head of counterterrorism or something like that. I would say, yeah, you're, you're looking basically at, at uh, maybe the one or two or three top people in uh, something like the FBI, something like the NSA, 
but more likely, the, the, the evidence seems to indicate this mega was a, a political player. So that would actually more likely be someone's that cabinet level or somebody equivalent to that. Mm. Like, that... you know, yeah. Yeah, go on. Oh, no, please, you go on. <laughs> no, I, I would say the speculation would be that I think the, that it's somebody maybe in the National Security Council structure, someone mm. like that. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's what I was trying to get at with the uh, the counterterrorism thing. Somebody uh, who's an executive agent, not necessarily a secretary or something, but but pretty high up. And and I think one of the uh, other qualifications for this uh, mega is that uh, they've had this level of clearance in multiple administrations, right? Yeah, the individual involved would have, uh, so it seems, would have been uh, in place during both Republican and Democratic administrations. All right, interesting stuff. Uh, I'm sure that, that narrows, narrows it down, down to speculation on who it might be. It's got to be less than a dozen people on <laughs> well, your on your list, though, right? Try about six, yeah. Try about six, yeah, half a dozen on on Phil's short list there. All right. Well, I'm sure that there's a grand jury investigating this right now, right? Of course. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm sure that's actually not the case. Now, this guy, Ben Amika Dish, apparently gave the Israelis uh, information on F-15s and I think even on nuclear weaponry. Is that right? Yeah, uh, my understanding is he gave them avionics information on F-15s and 16s, and also there was uh, information that, that dealt with uh, nuclear weapons and delivery systems. Now... This is like an old case, sort of a cold case. This guy's an old man now. He's not going to be uh, prosecuted for treason? Well, I would like to see him prosecuted for treason, but uh, it's not likely. I'm quite surprised, actually, they let him out on bail. And, you know, this is this is a case of, of, uh, of treason if there ever was one. And uh, But he's out on bail. I would think there's considerable risk of, of his fleeing to Israel, from which he would not be extradited. So I'm quite... Uh, confused by the uh, signal that the U.S. courts are sending on this. Well, now, when this story came out, you wrote on the American Conservatives blog at uh, amconmag.com that you were hearing that the leak actually came from inside Israel, that it seemed uh, perhaps, I believe you were speculating, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe this was coming from anti-war forces inside Israel. The timing of it was uh, part of an attempt to disrupt Cheney's plot for war with Iran. Yeah, I've, I've heard a couple of theories, you know, uh, at that time and, and since then, but everybody seems to agree that the, uh, the FBI did not have any any information, did not have a clue about this, this Ben Ami Kaddish uh, uh, spying for Israel, but that the information came from Israel. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the channel would have been, but obviously it had to come from somebody in the security services or, or relatively high up in the government. And the in initial speculation was that this was poss possibly done to kind of throw a spanner into the works of, of the plans that uh, Israel and the United States were cranking up to attack Iran just to to kind of, you know, throw things off. And uh, uh, I'm not so sure that that's true or not, but uh, that certainly was the speculation. Interesting. Now, uh, we got to get to the neoconservatives because uh, I don't think it's been uh, alleged, at least for a long, long time, that uh, our household name uh, favorite neocons like Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, Douglas Fyfe, are actually Israeli spies, uh, but are clearly such Israeli partisans that their foreign policy uh, seems to be all centered around the clean break plan that uh, David Wilmser and uh, Douglas Fyfe and Richard Pearl wrote up for Benjamin Netanyahu in 1996. And uh, they've been described, I guess, as agents of influence for Israel. Uh, what do you say about that? What do you think of them? Well, it's uh, first of all, let me point out that all those people you named have, in fact, been investigated for under suspicion of passing classified information to Israel. So it's not, sh not just pure speculation that these people uh, would on occasion have, have indicated or demonstrated a willingness to go beyond uh, what are the normal restraints to assist the Israelis as they see it. Whether they're agents of Israel or agents of influence for Israel or not is, is a matter of semantics, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. These people are all uh, deeply uh, in love with Israel and uh, have have uh, strong and continuing relationships and very often uh, business relationships. Uh, Doug Feith, as you know, and Richard Pearl both have had business interests in, in Israel that have enriched them greatly. And uh, so that's, that's one side of it. But I think that the point is that the neocons have been engaging in this con job forever, which is that essentially in the, uh, the way they see the world, 
Israel and the United States are united and are virtually one entity, and everybody else is, is basically a, a shade of gray or a shade of black. And uh, this is, of course, a, a, a horrible misreading of the reality of the world in terms of the U.S. national interest. Uh, but this is the kind of uh, soap that they've been selling. And uh, uh, some of them may, in fact, believe that Israel and the United States have, have no differences and they have uh, everything, everything in common. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a view that I would share. Well, Justin Romano at Antiwar.com says that the Iraq war really must be viewed in context as an Israeli covert operation to get America to fight their enemies for them. You know, there, Scott, there's an interesting story that's been coming out. You realize the Senate Intelligence Committee back uh, on the 5th, I think it was, released a report, and the, and the media focused on the fact that the report said that the Bush administration had been lying about the war. Mm -hmm. Well, but this is the, the long-awaited and long-buried Phase 2 report, and uh, I think primarily, Phil, it, it's uh, focused on uh, Michael Ledeen and Larry Franklin's meetings down there in Rome. Well, and that's what I was going to say, but there was uh, some intriguing stuff about uh, how it might have been the Iranians who, <laughs> who arranged some of this stuff by running uh, alleged defectors, Iranian defectors, into Ledeen and, and Gorbani Far and and into the neocons at the Pentagon because it was in the Iranian interest for us to take out Saddam Hussein. So that's yet another wrinkle to the story, and I think it's, it's maybe in some ways an amusing uh, sidebar in that the, the neocons might have been duped by the Iranian government. Right. Well, this is something that people have talked about uh, ever since it came out that Ahmed Chalabi had been passing secrets to the Iranians. I mean, hell, the INC headquarters was in Tehran, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, to get back to your, your other assertion about, you know, about Israel's war and everything like that, I'm, my feeling on the war is I'm, I'm, I read Justin's column and I, and I, and I agree with uh, virtually everything he said, but my feeling on the war is that the Israel lobby and Israel itself were, were enablers of this war and that if uh, they had not been partisan and gung-ho on this issue and had not gotten their neocons cranked up in the, in the administration to, to push for it, it would have never happened. There were other things that caused the war to happen too, uh, but and, and oil is certainly one of them. But the, I, I believe that without the Israel interest in this, there would not have been a war against Iraq. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the upcoming war against Iran? I keep trying to find other parts of the war party to identify besides the Israel lobby, and I don't really seem to find them outside of the vice president's office anyway. Well, I think you could look at the, uh, Mr. Hagee, uh, a, a pastor Hagee, as he was referred to, Yesterday, when someone was asking me about him uh, and his uh, Christians United for Israel, they're uh, they're certainly Christians and and uh, they're certainly interested in the, well, they're interested in the end of the world, which will come about by apparently uh, attacking Iran and uh, and then which somehow will bring about the second coming of Christ. Well, Phil, as long as you brought him up, I might as well play this one clip real quick. There's an army of 200 million marching down the river Euphrates, coming toward the Persian Gulf, there's going to be the meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion that is unplanned for on the charts of all of the dictators of the earth. It's not an invasion from the north or the south or the east or the west. It's an invasion from heaven. And he will establish his kingdom, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. I am telling you that makes this message one of the most thrilling prophetic messages you've ever heard in your life. You could get raptured out of this building before I get through finished preaching. We are that close. John the Revelator says in Revelation the 19th, And I, John, saw the heavens open, and he that sat upon a white horse was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. And out of his mouth shall go a two-edged sword, with which he shall smite the nations of the earth. So, Phil, I'm not so sure that if I was a member of the Israel lobby that I would counsel it a good idea to ally with lunatics like this. Well, uh, yeah, but uh, but nevertheless, they are allied to him. He, as you know, he's he's spoken at APAC, and was very well received there. And uh, he's also a good friend of Joe Lieberman, and up until recently, John McCain. So he has uh, he has a lot of friends, and also uh, Hagee has uh, has has up until recently had excellent access to the White House. But as far as other, like you mentioned, oil in in the in terms of Iraq. 
it's sort of a broader coalition of people coming together for the war with Iraq. Are we really simply down to APAC, uh, the vice president's office, and the Cornerstone Church pushing for this next one? Uh, well, of course, there's Israel itself. Uh, that's, that's also been uh, making uh, loud noises that it's about to do something, particularly over the past couple of weeks. I don't know. I mean, I can't see anyone else out there who seems to think that going to war with Iran is a good idea. But let's face it, it only really takes the president to feel that way to, to let a war happen. Uh, the, the Air Force seems to be interested in proving that it's, it's able to fight a war and, and is, is willing to do the bombing or whatever it would take. Uh, I'm not so sure that, um, that a lot of people in the Army would share the, uh, that optimism. But um, anyway... You know, there are always interest groups. You can always co-opt people into doing things. You can always you can always buy people. This this administration has been very good at buying people in terms of uh, you know to silence generals uh, so they don't criticize the the administration. They retire and then they get these plum jobs with the defense contractors and so on and so forth. Everybody's looking out for for number one, and uh, you can always find people to say what you want them to say or do what you want them to do. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, George Bush has been uh, saying over in Europe that he really regrets a lot of his macho talk, bring them on, and that kind of thing. Then he turned right around and said the Iranians need to know all options are on the table. And uh, here we still are on and, the eve of war perpetually, it seems like. Yeah, and Condoleezza Rice said the week before that, uh, that there was no point in talking to the Iranians because there's nothing to talk about. Well, I mean, that's an idiot comment if there ever was one. There are about a 100 things to talk about. And now, you know what, let's go ahead and get to some more of the details here. She will not sit down with them. She accused them of refusing to sit down with her. But the demand is that they must cease all uranium enrichment in order for any negotiations to begin. Basically, she demands unconditional surrender in order to get the talk started, Phil. And then she says that they won't talk to her. That's right. And I, and I find it as crazy as you do. The, uh, the, the fact is that um, the insistence on preconditions that are basically a surrender by one side doesn't produce negotiations anywhere. I don't, I don't under, well, I do understand what's going on here. Obviously the administration doesn't want to talk to them, doesn't want to come to any, any kind of understanding with them, and it's, and it's using this kind of line as, as a justification for, for avoiding that. All right. Now, you're a former CIA covert operative. I'm sure you must still have, uh, friends inside the intelligence community. You always come out with all these, uh, Excellent articles uh, sourced from unnamed sources and things like that that the rest of us don't have. And uh, we all know, everybody remembers, that last November the CIA said that the Iranians have no nuclear weapons program and that the only one they ever had uh, was in 2003, was given up in 2003 and never involved the introduction of nuclear materials or anything else. Uh, do you know, Phil Giraldi, honest truth, scouts honor, do you know of any evidence that has come out since then that would indicate that the Iranians are, in fact, building nuclear weapons? The short answer is no. I do not know of any evidence that's credible that doesn't come from defector sources or doesn't come from the Israelis that would indicate that they have a nuclear weapons program. All right, because uh, the McClatchy News story today, and, and they always do a really good job, but they cite concerns, new concerns by the IAEA are uh, you know, putting this uh, back on the front burner. And meanwhile, I just read the new IAEA report, and it says in there that they have been able to continue to verify the non-diversion. They've been able to continue to prove the negative, to prove the non-diversion of any nuclear material to a special or other military purpose. Right. Yeah, well, you know, the thing is there's, a, there's, a, there's always there is a suspicion that Iran has a secret program. And I must admit, if I were Iran and I had 160,000 U.S. troops right next door, and a huge naval flotilla right off the coast, uh, I'd probably be thinking of developing a nuclear weapon real fast. So, I, you know, it, it, the plausibility of this is real high. But at the same time, uh, the evidence is not there. There is no evidence. And, and the thought of us going to a war, to a war situation, based on no evidence, just speculation, I think is totally unacceptable. I, I think it's, uh, I would like to, certainly like to see the American people tell their elected officials that this is unacceptable. Well, and it is the kind of thing where we can tell that our government knows it's lying when they make all these assertions to the contrary. I mean, you're telling me there's no evidence, and yet they're telling me all day there's evidence. Yeah. Well, that's true. But this, is, this has been uh, 
paralleled in terms of their other claims against Iran, the claims about the Iran, you know, the Iranians are killing our troops and that sort of thing. There's a, as far as I know, there have only been two attempts made by the occupation forces to show some of these weapons allegedly that have come from Iran. The first one was back, I think, in 2007, and uh, it was so unconvincing that the, the media uh, wrote up uh, accounts of it saying that, uh, that it didn't demonstrate anything that the, that the, um, the Pentagon was trying to demonstrate. And, and then they tried it again last month, and then they had to cancel the briefing because they took another look at the weapons and determined that none of them were from Iran. It's kind of, you know, the whole administration policy towards Iran is you construct these stories and you stick with them. And it doesn't matter if you have any evidence for it or not. And they just stick with the story and stick with the story. And they know that the press is going to play the story over and over again. And, and eventually the U.S. public will get convinced that Iran has nuclear weapons already, that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, sending its soldiers across the border to kill our troops. You know, uh, it, it's just unending. Yeah, well, you know, it's... Interesting. That was Hitler's technique. He defined it. He says, well, you just tell a really big lie and you tell it over and over again. No one would ever believe that you'd lie about something that big. So it works. That's right. That's uh, right. I hate to, you know, bring up the Hitler analogy because that just ruins all arguments or whatever. But that's what George Bush says. Well, in my line of work, you just have to keep saying things over and over and over again to catapult the propaganda, which is, I guess, you know, his version of <laughs> explaining the big lie technique. Well, that's right. And he certainly has... Uh... He has uh, cited Hitler uh, more than once in terms of uh, his allegations about both Saddam Hussein and about uh, Iran. Yeah, there you go. So that makes it fair. I can invoke Hitler in my criticism of him. All right, now l let's get back to Israeli spying uh, here in the United States a little bit more. Uh, I get the idea from, uh, from your article that uh, no matter what the FBI or the CIA or the NSA or anybody tries to do within the United States government agencies to, you know, limit the influence of uh, possible Israeli infiltration and so forth, but uh, also to investigate and prosecute and do anything about these things when they find out about them after the fact. It seems to always be thwarted by political pressure from above. Is that right? Yeah, sure, because if you're going to, you know, you can investigate all you want, but if you're going to prosecute someone for a crime that has to be done by the Justice Department, and if the Justice Department is re receiving instructions from the White House saying that we're not going to go after these people, then nothing's going to happen. And that's how it happens consistently. That's how it happens consistently. There would have been, uh, it's my understanding from sources inside the, the government, that there would have been a lot of prosecutions of Israeli spies because many of them have been caught. But instead of them being prosecuted, they're just basically uh, released and allowed to go home. Now, um, let's try to, if it's all right with you, I'd like to try to get back a little bit to the art students and the movers here before September 11th. The movers, particularly, uh, were in New Jersey in Liberty State Park. And uh, as you uh, detail in your article, after only the first tower had been struck, when 99% of the American people uh, who knew what had happened were assuming that this was some terrible accident, these men were uh, seen celebrating the attack, and uh, locals called 911 on them. That's right. That's how they were, uh, they were discovered. I mean, they were seen by horrified locals dancing and singing and, and in front of the uh, tower, the burning tower. And as I say, this was before the second tower was struck, and apparently the implication was that everyone at that point, well, I was at CIA headquarters that day, and I, even at CIA headquarters, everybody assumed it was a, it was a horrible accident. So the uh, movers must have known something or perhaps were, were speculating on something. Who knows? Well, now, I don't know. What is that supposed to tell me about the CIA, no offense, when you guys weren't suspecting a thing, I thought there had you know, been hair on fire all summer long that something was going to happen. You weren't suspicious of what this might be? Well, I don't think anybody had put it all together to, to be suspicious of a, of a plane being used as a missile. And uh, if it had been an, a different kind of terrorist attack, I think everybody would have realized instantly that's what it was. But this was, uh, this was uh, new. In, in, you know, admittedly, there were a couple years before, there had been an attempt to... Uh, hijacked some airliners in the Philippines by, by al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So it should not have been a big surprise, but I think it, in, in this case it was. Yeah. Well, I guess that's why people are so suspicious about 9-11, because they just can't believe that you guys are that incompetent. 
Well, don't say you guys. I don't work for them anymore. I know, uh, I know. I'm sorry. No <laughs> offense. I'm just playing. No, but I, the, yeah, I, you know, there's there's certainly enough blame to go around on on um, what happened to 9/11, and there have been a couple of books written that have have shown how the dots should have been connected both by the FBI and by the CIA, but they didn't for various reasons, mostly bureaucratic. And uh, you know, but that's that's the way it goes sometimes, where you can. You can have all the information in the world. In some ways, the more information you have, the more blind you are because you're seeing so many things. You're not seeing something that should be obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all that data, but not much wisdom buried in it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so I guess you guys must have been really angry when it uh, became, uh, well, at least it began to seem as though the Israelis knew more about what was going to happen than you guys, at least these five guys in the white van. Well, yeah, and, and possibly the art students, too. The, uh, there was an interesting article that I did not use in my, um, in my article because I couldn't verify it. Uh, shortly after 9-11, the German, uh, very respectable German weekly news publication, Die Zeit, uh, had an article about uh, 9-11, and they interviewed an Israeli intelligence officer. And the intelligence officer reported, he said, that if the art students had been allowed to stay in the United States a bit longer, they might have been able to stop 9-11. And uh, as I say, I didn't use it because it was something I couldn't verify. I didn't know who the intelligence officer was by name. I couldn't find that out. But, of course, if it's true, it's an admission by the Israeli government that they had a massive spying program going on in the United States, and it was directed uh, against um, uh, Arabs and specifically against the, uh, these hijackers. Well, you know, Christopher Ketchum, in his piece that he did for Counterpunch, speculates, and he calls it speculation in the piece, that uh, perhaps the CIA had outsourced the monitoring of at least the two guys that uh, came into San Diego from Malaysia uh, to the Mossad, um, rather than trusting the FBI with the job, which I could see that as a reasonable conclusion that someone in the CIA would come to, to not trust the FBI, but that... He speculated this because there was a meeting between uh, some Israeli officials and the FBI in August of 2001, and then just the next day or two days later, uh, these two guys' names, I believe Al Midhar and, and his buddy, appeared on the list, on the uh, the watch list or the the uh, some kind of uh, look out for these guys list of the FBI. Mm-hmm. Well, I th but I think they got I think that information was eventually passed by the CIA. I think if you if you see the the timeline and all this, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I, no, I find it implausible that the agency would outsource to Mossad because uh, I assure you, inside the agency, Mossad is not thought of very well. Uh, on in all quarters. Uh, well, no, the political level will always you know do whatever they're told to do, but the uh, working level CIA officers are not particularly fond of Mossad. They. And, and, uh, they, they have felt for a long time that Mossad, in spite of agreements and everything like that, doesn't ever play fair. And that, uh, the intelligence that comes out of Mossad is usually bogus. And it's essentially produced to keep the United States, uh, reliant on Israel. And, uh, the information itself is, is, has been viewed as quite, um, quite doubtful. I remember reading in uh, By Way of Deception by Victor Ostrowski, and I don't really know a whole lot about the guy, whether he's considered to be very credible or not, but he wrote that their attitude inside the Mossad is that if the Americans know something that they need to know, well, they better tell us. But if they know something the Americans need to know, ah, they're big boys. They'll figure it out. Yeah, you know, well, I would consider that to be true, yeah. Yeah. And could you comment on uh, Ostrowski in general? Do you know? Well, I don't know a whole lot about him. I, I, I have read the book, although it was a number of years ago that I read it, and I found at the time that what he was saying was quite credible. Um, you know, the Israelis, for uh, much of their history, were indeed a country under siege. And I can see if you're a small country, you're relying on your intelligence service, you've got to play the game as if everybody is a potential enemy. I can understand that. But the fact is that's not been true in Israel for the last 40 years or so. And, uh, the, and Israel is now the, the dominant military and economic power in the Middle East, no question about it. And um, uh, these realities don't have to stay in place. And, and that's why I feel that the uh, Israeli spying against the United States is just, at this point in time, is just not justified. And for the United States to sit back and let it happen, 
uh, one of the things we haven't discussed is that uh, the spying is, is largely focused on, on military technology and types of information that the Israelis then use in their own armaments industry, and they sell to other people like the Chinese. So this stuff winds up in places we don't want it to wind up, and then you have American companies paying for all the research and development costs, and the Israelis stealing it, and, and they wind up with the product, and they can compete against U.S. companies very effectively. Uh, so the U.S. companies are at a disadvantage. Uh, I, I'm not a great fan of defense contractors, but insofar as we do need their services, this is, this is not good for the United States. Well, and this is something that was a big scandal a couple of years back, right, that the Israelis had given some very uh, highly advanced early warning radar systems to the Chinese? Uh, they, they gave some uh, missile technology, missile sidewinder tech. missile technology. They were trying to sell very advanced surveillance aircraft technology to the Indians. And uh, this was back, I think, in 2005. And the, uh, the Pentagon actually, in one of its rare uh, standing up to the Israeli moments, uh, told them that they wouldn't let it happen, and they actually started to cut off contacts with uh, with the Israeli officers and, and things like that to show their disapproval. So the Israelis backed off on it. Yeah, can Israeli uh, or the Israel lobby's influence in Washington be overstated? I mean, the spectacle of the APAC conference where uh, McCain, Clinton, and Obama all three went and just bowed and scraped, and Obama even advanced what had been off the table for a long time, the idea that uh, all of Jerusalem belongs to the Israelis. I guess they're going to rebuild the temple now and all this stuff, according to him. Well, I guess so. I mean, it's uh, can the, uh, the question, can the lobby, the strength be overstated? I don't think so, uh, as long as what one is only looking at uh, Middle Eastern policy, which is obviously what they're interested in. Uh, no, I think they have an absolute stranglehold on the policy right now, uh, and they have the stranglehold in both parties and also in the U.S. media. Do you think that uh, Stephen Rosen and Keith Weissman, who were the uh, indicted co-conspirators with the convicted spy Larry Franklin, will ever go to trial? Uh, I'm beginning to doubt if they ever will, because it, it just keeps, seems to keep dragging on and dragging on and dragging on. And, uh, and I, I know it's the desire of the administration to make this thing go away, and I would imagine a Democratic administration coming in, or indeed John McCain coming in, uh, to continue the Republican uh, control would uh, would be similarly inclined. I, they, I think they would make every effort to make it go away. Should we consider it a miracle that these guys were ever, or that you know Franklin was ever prosecuted, that this story uh, ever came out at all? Uh, well, Franklin, of course, worked for the Pentagon, so you know that was a prosecution of somebody for leaking secrets. But these other two guys, of course, worked for APAC, and that's a lot more sensitive than the Pentagon. So. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I'm surprised. Uh, actually, I'm surprised that, that there ever even was a prosecution. Goodness gracious. All right. Well, um, oh, let me ask you one more thing. You broke the story in 2005 in the American Conservative magazine that uh, the war plans that Dick Cheney was having the Air Force draw up for uh, possible strikes on Iran included the uh, possible use of nuclear weapons on them. And you told me, uh, I guess probably about a year ago, I think, Phil, that uh, there were two possibilities for the use of nuclear weapons in a war against Iran. The first would be to try to get at the underground nuclear facilities, uh, say, for example, at Natanz, uh, buried under 85 feet of granite or so. And then the second would be to basically, I think you said, hold them in our back pocket in order to tell the Iranians, don't you dare fight back against us in any effective way or we'll nuke you. Is, do you believe that that is still the case, that this kind of strategy is included? and Dick Cheney's war plans for Iran? Yeah, I think both of those elements are still there. I think there are some uh, targets like uh, the, 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 not just Natanz, but the, the, the Iranians have been preparing for this attack for five years, and they have a lot of their command and control and other facilities deep underground, apparently. So this would be a way to, to, to neutralize those sites. Uh, and so I, I suspect it's still very much in the war plan, whether... This is a first strike concept or something that uh, might be used later. I don't know, but uh, but certainly I think that the um, the threat of of the United States escalating if Iran doesn't roll over uh, is still very high, and I think that would include the threat of using nuclear weapons if the Iranians uh, were very successful in their retaliation. Say say the Iranians are able to to cut the supply line from Kuwait up into uh, Iraq, and are we have we have 100,000 plus troops kind of uh, besieged. I don't, I don't know any better way to describe it. 
uh, we might threaten nuclear weapons in a situation like that. I could, I can easily see that. And you have sources inside the national security bureaucracy who are indicating to you that that's actually the case. Well, I have had sources tell me in the past that the uh, the nuclear option would be there with Iran if the uh, the situation began to get out of control. So that's what they were saying. What they're saying right now, I'm I'm not sure. All right, everybody, that's uh, Philip Giraldi, right, Smoke and Mirrors at Antiwar.com. His new piece in the American Conservative magazine is called The Spy Who Loves Us. Pay no mind to the Mossad agent on the line. Yeah, I'll try to ignore him, Phil. Okay. Thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you, Scott.